Today we're going to be looking at another one of Kyle Hill's videos, specifically this one here called The Elephant's Foot Corpse of Chernobyl. But hey, in case you don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. By the fall of 1986, emergency crews fighting to contain the nuclear disaster at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant made it into the basement. They turned a corner into a steam corridor beneath failed reactor number four and found not steam, but black lava that had oozed out of the core, eaten through meters of concrete, and settled on the floor. The largest and most famous formation in the corridor was a two-ton wrinkled mass that their radiation sensors firmly told them not to approach. It's just creepy looking. What it can form after a major accident like this, uh, this mass of busted fuel assemblies, fuel cladding, and the reactor vessel itself forming this unholy abomination. With cameras pushed in from around a corner, the workers documented the dimly lit mass. According to readings taken at the time, the still hot portion of the molten reactor core was putting out enough radiation to give anyone within three feet of it a lethal dose in just 200 seconds. During a routine test on April 26, 1986, reactor number four at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant experienced a power surge born of poor reactor design and human error, which- So he says routine, it's a bit different than that. The test was trying to see if the remnants of a turbine coasting down after a loss of power from would be enough to supply the emergency systems until their backup diesels picked up. I talked about this in my review of the Chernobyl series. I'll pin that in a comment below, but really they should have had better diesels because their diesels would have taken on the order of 60 seconds to come up to speed when in modern nuclear plants, it's eight seconds on a loss of power to activate the safety systems. It also involved turning their safety systems off in order to do this test so they wouldn't inadvertently activate too soon and invalidate the test. This test had bad idea written all over it. And it's possible it might be routine for some scenarios back then, but it would not be routine now and it was never been allowed. The case study of Chernobyl is presented on a regular basis to people in nuclear pl power plants specifically on the testing procedure itself and everything that went wrong with it. ...an emergency shutdown. The shutdown did not work. The attempt to manage the surge in power and alarming increase in the course temperature caused an even larger power surge of 12,000%. Control rods that are used to manage core temperature were inserted too late. A gross safety violation, there weren't even enough control rods in the core to begin with. There were all kinds of things. Yep, they, they waited way too long. And by the and when they, he's right, when they said they inserted the control rods, uh, they ordered a reactor trip to insert all control rods. It was way too little, too late. The reactor was in an unstable configuration and the control rods had a flaw in it where they actually had graphite as a tip. And graphite actually increases reactor power. So that's the equivalent of having your brake accelerate you before it slows you down. That's how bad of an idea this was. Their insertion into the increasingly hot core caused the rods themselves to crack and fracture, locking them in place. Heat and power output continued to rise until the water that was used to cool the entire reactor began to vaporize. That's another design flaw. It took so long for those control rods to insert. In a modern nuclear power plant, a reactor trip, all the rods fall, hit the bottom of the core in less than two seconds. Chernobyl, it was on the order of 20 seconds. And the core was so deformed, like he said, that the control rods would get stuck. So they didn't even do what they're supposed to be doing. And when that happens, you're actually raising the amount of power produced at the bottom of the core. So you went just making the reaction even more unstable generating massive amounts of pressure. The first explosion from the steam inside the reactor was large enough to send a four million pound lid of the reactor. This is a really cool animation. I haven't, I haven't seen this particular one before. ...through the roof of the building. 
the reactor now fatally damaged, the remaining cooling water from broken channels seeped into the reactor as well, flashing directly into steam as it touched the soon-to-be glowing-hot nuclear fuel rods. A second, even more massive explosion followed shortly after the first, belching core material into the air, spreading fire and radioactive ash. The second explosion was from a hydrogen buildup. The uh, interaction between the fuel cladding and water. So that reaction happens much more quickly at higher temperatures. So we were already at extremely high temperatures from this reactor failing to shut itself down and being in an unstable situation. And that just added gasoline to that fire when by creating hydrogen, which is highly explosive. So another even bigger explosion happened. It is estimated that the fires that rage in Reactor 4 spread 400 times more radiation than the nuclear blast that wiped Hiroshima off the map. That's true. Um, the radiological impact was far more than from the uh, than from a nuclear explosion. Granted, th these are these atomic bombings are relatively small compared to nuclear weapons that exist now and that existed in the 1980s. Yeah, the radiological impact was a lot a lot worse but i would kind of that doesn't mean this was as destructive as the atomic bombs so, so the, the explosions while they were bad were not as <laughs> didn't cause nearly as much damage as the as the atomic bombings but the radiological impact was worse there was a lot more of a cleanup that had to be done Partially because this happened on the ground compared to an airburst nuclear weapon. And also, I would liken this to the difference between the atomic bombings were kind of like a sudden tidal wave of radiological material, but quickly went away afterwards. This was the equivalent of a thunderstorm that just sits there for days on end, which being from Houston, those are really bad too. <laughs> so it's just, it's a very different type of disaster than, a, uh, than the detonation of a nuclear weapon. Over 160,000 square kilometers of Russia and Europe were eventually contaminated. With a glowing heart no longer shielded by tons of steel and concrete, the core could no longer be cooled. It began to melt. When you hear about a nuclear reactor melting down, it's not simply illustrative language. Without proper cooling, radioactive materials used as fuel get hotter and hotter due to their close proximity and continuous emission of high energy particles. Nuclear fuel literally heats itself up until it melts, turning into what is arguably the most dangerous substance on Earth. So this same phenomenon happened at Fukushima as far as the decay heat portion. But one thing for, for Chernobyl, they couldn't even shut the reactor down. What actually shut the reactor down was the explosion tearing bits and pieces of the reactor to pieces. So the reactor, it needs to all be next to each other for it to continue to cause fissions. That's what shut the reactor down was an explosion. So it was very hot, very fresh. The, decay, the heat generated from that reactor many thousands and thousands of times more heat than the reactors during the Fukushima disaster because they already shut down the reactors safely immediately. That, that wasn't the issue. It was all of the backup systems that supplied cooling water to the shut down reactors and spent fuel pools. All of those systems failed. That and many other reasons is why Chernobyl was way, way worse than Fukushima. If you wanted to know what the most dangerous material ever created was, Corium would be a good answer. Coolant caused a meltdown of the uranium fuel, up to a third of which was scattered into the atmosphere. Estimates vary. But up to 160,000 kilograms of uranium, radioactive in many thousands of degrees, melted and flowed into the bottom of the reactor vessel. Eight days later, the flow had melted through the reactor's lower shield. Oozing through basement pipes, pooling in steam corridors, and eating through two meters of steel and concrete, the radioactive lava flow from reactor number four eventually cooled enough to solidify in the basement. Thousands of kilograms of molten uranium oxide. Look at that. It's like it's its own geological force here. That's <laughs> I don't think I've actually seen these pictures in color. 
sand, metal, silica glass, and other materials, a composite monstrosity dubbed Corium. In addition to being the world's arguably most dangerous material, it might be also the rarest artificial material. Corium is only formed in a nuclear meltdown. Hence the term, though I guess it's not necessarily the same material if you're using a different fuel type, fuel composition, just kind of just like having a, you can have different alloys of corium for lack of a better word. Corium <laughs> has only been created accidentally five times. Once in the Three Mile Island reactor in Pennsylvania in 1979, once at Chernobyl, and three separate times during the much more recent Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. Okay. He's counting Fukushima as three. Okay, I was like, I only knew of three. <laughs> now I say accidentally created because there are scientists and engineers who study corium and create it on purpose. For example, this is a video of molten uranium oxide, like what would have been found beneath Chernobyl, bubbling and boiling at around 2000 degrees Celsius at Argonne National Laboratory. That is, that is super hot. That's one of the reasons why, um, why during the response to Chernobyl, you couldn't just pour water on the thing. That hot, it's going to explode, for lack of a better word. It's just going to, it's not even, before it even gets close to the heat source, it's going to flash the steam so hard that water's not going to fight this fire. It's not technically a fire, but it's not going to stop this thing from, uh, continuing to uh, release all that heat. Remember, this heat is self-generated. All by itself, corium can get half as hot as the surface of the sun. Corium is never pure nuclear fuel. Rather, it's a radioactive Frankenstein of fuel rods, <laughs> fission products, the control rods in the core, concrete from the floors, steel from the surrounding structures, and the chemicals created when blazing uranium reacts with air, water, and steam. That's a good way of putting it. Here you can see a simulation of what corium actually does, easily disintegrating concrete as it escapes confinement. In the lab, corium is still terrifying but controlled and mesmerizing in a way that lava and its destructive capabilities can often be. I never actually knew that it was generated in labs on purpose. I mean, it makes sense. You're going to want to study it. I don't... It'd be interesting to know if it was done in labs prior to the Three Mile Island. The more radiation released from a mass of atoms, the more dangerous it is. Reports from Chernobyl estimate that immediately after formation, the elephant's foot was emitting nearly 10,000 rentgens per hour. That's a lot. So rentgens, unit of exposure. If you were to convert that to absorbed dose equivalent, your best case scenario is 100 sieverts, and that's assuming it's all gamma, which it isn't. It's this, like Kyle said, it's this diverse amalgamation of a bunch of different radioactive sources. But, so 100 sieverts per hour, yeah, that's definitely going to kill you in on the order of minutes. 100 sieverts is 10 times what it takes to kill you. It only takes about one-tenth of that rate to kill a person. A single hour next to the elephant's foot would expose you to the equivalent. Yeah, that's about right. Um, rentgens, you don't normally use, use the term rentgen for, des for describing effects on a person. For all intents and purposes, that's a low ball. <laughs> 134 were hospitalized with acute radiation syndrome. 28 of them died within months following the incident. And current estimates put the total number of deaths from related cancers due to the contamination across Russia and Europe somewhere between 9 and 16,000. Something to be said about those estimates is that it's very challenging to assess which cancers are necessarily from Chernobyl and which ones are not. There's a lot of uncertainty in these numbers. You know, the UN estimate, and this is using the linear no threshold model, which assumes every bit of radiation you get over background radiation increases your risk of cancer. That study done in 2005 came up with 4,000, and that one's also very heavily contested. But 9,000 to 6,000 would be quite a uh, highball because there, there are a lot of extrapolations and you can extrapolate 
from that number further outward if you're going to look at region if you're going to look at further regions um, in Russia, Eastern Europe, if you want to look at the uh, effects that were going to Western Europe as well. Really need to know is this was by far one of the worst uh, radiological accident and any other nuclear accident like Fukushima, Three Mile Island or nothing compared to the effects of this of this Chernobyl accident. After the nuclear fires at Chernobyl were finally controlled, a feat which took nine full days, workers scrambled to contain the invisible dangers of the failed core. In May of 1986, construction began on the sarcophagus, a gigantic concrete enclosure built to seal off the radiation from the outside world. But the ruins would never be entirely contained, even after the installation of a much larger tomb in 2016. The Chernobyl sarcophagus is so that sarcophagus was pretty hastily constructed. They knew it wasn't going to last the test of time, which is why the, this newer structure that you see here was developed. Outfitted with access points, allowing researchers to observe the core and workers to enter. In December of 1986, researchers discovered the elephant's foot. It was a couple of meters across, over 4,000 kilograms, and put out enough radiation to prevent anyone from getting near it for more than yeah. just a few seconds. But despite the dangers, we have pictures like this one of the deadly mass. How? Well, from a safe distance, workers, or liquidators as they were called, rigged up a crude wheeled camera contraption and pushed it slowly and from around a corner towards the elephant's foot. This photo, almost never seen in discussions of the elephant's foot, was taken in 1990, four years after the incident. Never seen this one before. Interesting. The slide the photo is on was given to a Dr. Bill Zoller at the University of Washington's Department of Chemistry. The caption reads, quote, This is a slide I obtained from the Russians. It shows what is called the elephant's foot. The Russians obtained this picture by sending a man down there with a camera. He took one picture and then came back up. Curious how that radiological briefing went. All right, you can, you can be there for three seconds. <laughs> and you're going to be absolutely prepared and having mapped out what your travel path is, knowing what all the tripping hazards are going to be, because you don't want to trip and fall down in front of that thing. That's a quick job. 10,000 Ronkin per hour. Wow. I was told that he died from the radiation he had received. This picture cost a man his life. And Wow. And I've never even seen this picture. That's... Eh. When this photo of the elephant's foot was taken, 10 years after the disaster, the elephant's foot was only emitting one-tenth of the radiation it once had been. Still, merely 500 seconds of exposure at this level would bring on mild radiation sickness, and a little over an hour of exposure would be fatal. Yeah. Another photo, a timed selfie by Russian nuclear inspector Artur Korneyev, is arguably the most famous and most disturbing photo of the elephant's foot. According to an investigation by Atlas Obscura, the ghostly image of Artur is likely not due to anything spooky, just the shutter speed, as is the time-lapse-like streak from the flashlight. But the graininess, the grittiness you see in the photo, that's from the radiation. What about the lightning bolts, though? Also a shutter speed thing? Not an expert of cameras, especially cameras from back then. Over time, the elephant's foot has decomposed. It has puffed dust while its surface cracked, but more than 30 years later, it is still quite dangerous. In 2001, levels were measured that would give you a lethal dose of radiation in under 60 minutes. Extrapolating from how radiation sources degrade over time, today that deadly limit is probably a few hours, and today, the elephant's foot, once nuclear lava eating through the corpse of Chernobyl, is still hotter than the surrounding air temperature and environment thanks to the radioactive heat pulsing inside of it. Decay heat's a very powerful thing. It's going to decrease exponentially, but it takes a very, very long time for it to go away completely. So that's, that's not surprising to hear. It's hotter than ambient. I'm, I'm actually surprised it's not more radioactive than it is now. But a lot of those, I guess a lot of, the, a lot of, a lot of fission products have more medium span half-lives on the order of years rather than centuries or millennia compared to like uranium itself a lot of those hotter sources do have 
smaller half lives so that that kind of makes sense in retrospect that it would that it would taper off both in terms of radioactivity and in terms of heat, but I wouldn't bear hug the thing now. Born of human error, continually generating heat in the basement of a failed power plant, the elephant's foot is still melting into the base of Chernobyl, albeit very slowly. If it hits groundwater, Glacial scientists pace. still worry that it could trigger another explosion like the one that killed the core and lifted four million pounds like it was a paperweight, or it could leach radioactive material into the water that nearby residents drink. If it's as cool, if, if it's just barely cooler than ambient, the first thing, no. But it's it's the contamination concern about it getting into the water supply, which is why you still need to monitor this thing and just to make sure it doesn't it doesn't continue to uh, to melt through. It's going to continue to slow down as it as it cools off. Long after bleeding from the core, this unique piece of waste continues to be a terrifying testament to the potential dangers of nuclear power, even though nuclear power as a whole is extremely safe. Until it is finally removed, if it ever is, the elephant's foot will be there for centuries, sitting in the dark basement of a concrete and steel sarcophagus, a symbol of one of humankind's most powerful tools gone wrong. One of the reasons why it hasn't been cleaned up like more is because the act of interacting with say the elephant's foot and all the radioactive material that's in there could kick up more radioactive particulate matter and actually make it more of a hazard than it is right now so it's it's one of those situations where the where it's actually safer sitting in the new safe confinement structure that kyle talked about earlier than it is to actively try to go in and haul bits and pieces of it away into a different sort of disposal site. It's more of the disposal site has been built around the actual structure. It's, it's kind of a weird situation where it in and of itself is went from nuclear power plant to waste disposal site. Always harrowing to hear stuff about Chernobyl. It was cool seeing those. I, I had no idea about the story of the guy who went and got the photo and ended up dying. That photo that ironically isn't one that most people see when they think of the elephant foot. I've, I've never seen that photo and we've Chernobyl is the most talked about nuclear disaster to everyone, especially people in the industry. So it's just all very sad. Entirely preventable. Again, I'll, uh, I'll pin a comment down below for my reaction to the HBO miniseries. I talk a lot more about, about the Chernobyl accident and that if you want to hear more about that. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.